Good morning, folks. Nice to see folks. It is the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission, July 17th uh, business agenda. It is 9 a.m. We will start with the roll call. Commissioner Ackerman. Here. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have four commissioners present. Four out of seven is quorum. We exist for purposes of today's business. Uh, kind of a not huge agenda, but we do have some things to take care of. Start with commissioner comments. Any commissioner have comments? Commissioner Cross? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly let the commission know that I had my first meeting as part of the West Slope Ta Operator Task Force this past week. Um, it was previously covered by Commissioner McGowan. Um, and I just wanted to say, first off, I appreciate all the hard work Commissioner McGowan did on that task force. Uh, I thought the meeting was very productive, helpful. I think both staff and operators on the West Slope are working towards accomplishing a lot of the goals that have been set out. Uh, and I think some of it has been demonstrated in some of the changes that are occurring at staff, including the separation of the enforcement group and, and some of the changes that are going on there seems to be very productive thus far, and I am excited to continue to work on that task force and see how everything ends up. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Cross, for the work there. Other commissioner comments? All right, seeing none, we did have one person sign up for public comment. I do not know if person is with us yet. It's Sarah Bard. Uh, last name is A-M-O-D-I-O. -O, Mo -O. Looks like Dr. Amodio is being elevated. Hello. Yes. Hi. You are recognized. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, commissioners, for recognizing me and my ability to speak here. Um, I do understand uh, that there's some consideration regarding the um, the Draco drilling um, initiative here in Erie. And I wanted to take this opportunity to comment on that and provide some feedback and insights. Um, I'm an Erie resident. I've been an Erie resident since, since 2004. I currently live right next to the open space um, for well uh, 124, of which Civitas has um, recently um, capped and had to do some remediation around. Um, for those of you that are aware of what happened with that situation, um, it was a historic leak that um, of which a thousand tons of contaminated soil right outside my, my backyard, um, less than 200 yards from my back door. Um, again, a thousand cubic tons of, tons of soil, contaminated soil with benzene, um, high levels of benzene had, had to be removed. Um, as a result, I am currently in the process of getting an evaluation. I was diagnosed with a very rare eosinophilic disease um, in 2015. And it's been determined that um, the symptoms and um, while there's not ever a, a direct causation, there is always a correlation between these things. Um, and it's been determined that my illness was precipitated and exacerbated by this <laughs> contamination. Okay, so I have a very intimate um, and very personal issue with what's going on with the oil and gas issue in, in Erie, and I'm very much against. I'm not going to give you talking points. I'm sure you all are very much aware of the talking points that are associated with drilling and I'm sure you're very much aware of what others have said about potential dangers and um, hazards of drilling. But I have an intimate stake in this. I have a very personal stake. I do not want this happening underneath my house. I've had to deal with this historic leak for the past few years, um, and I'm done. This is enough. Erie has had enough. And I'm sure that you've received the written comments um, through your your portal. People have taken the opportunity here in Erie to respond to that. I'm very much aware of that. But I wanted to meet with you personally so that you could put a face to the name to the person who is directly affected by this. And I understand that Civitas is what is the organization responsible 
um, and I understand that Erie is in collaboration with them. Um, I've had <laughs> with Rich Coolidge and uh, with Civitas, I've had nothing but um, backstabbing, um, kind of underhanded comments, not completely transparent with what's going on. And I do not trust that that's going to be carried forward with this, um, the Draco drilling that's going to be happening under Erie. And I've, I am appealing to all of you wholeheartedly to put the kibosh on this, to stop this. This has to end. The people's lives and well-being are at stake. My life and well-being has been at stake. I've had to go through chemo. I have lost the ability to walk and jog and enjoy the ability to um, partake in what Colorado has to offer because of what oil and gas has done to my health, period. And I need to have you aware of that. Um, so again, I am appealing. I am saying, please do not let this go forward in Erie. Erie has had enough. We have enough orphan wells. We have enough going on in this, in this town. This needs to end. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Amodio, and I still don't know if I have her last name pronounced correctly. I apologize It's Amodio. Yeah, you've got it correct. Thank okay, you. good. Um, I know that the, the uh, extraction Draco OGDP, which is docket 2401-00004, it's on our agenda for August 28th. And so I just want to let you know that we'll make sure that your comments are elevated into the docket Thank um, you. so that they are like, you know, we have process that we have to follow, right? And so we'll make sure that the comments are elevated into the docket. Um, if you would like to provide additional comments, uh, I can have staff reach out to you so that you can provide written comments. And if you are available and, and able to testify that day, that would be great as well. Um, so we, we take all this in due consideration. We're putting it into the right process. And we will certainly weigh your comments as we look at the matter on the docket on that day. Well, I do appreciate that. Unfortunately, I will not be available in August because I'm going to be traveling to Vanderbilt to meet with my care team who's overseeing my chemotherapy related to my disease at that time. Okay. Um, and so I will not be available. I will physically- Well, then we'll make sure. And then there, there we'll have a, a, a new commissioner on board at that point in time. And I'll make sure that she has had a chance to review the comments that were tendered this morning so that all of us are fully- vetted with regard to the comments that you're making regarding this matter. And just a point of clarification here, for the folks that have commented already onto the portal, will their comments be conveyed as well? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. All of that is created as part of the record, and we diligently review all the written comments that are submitted um, as part of our consideration of any permit process. Very good. And I would appreciate someone from ECMC reaching out to me directly. Um, I've, I've have tried in the past to reach out to ECMC through various modalities and through various portals um, and have had, I've received no response. Um, and that's unfortunate because I was hoping that my state would be a little bit more responsive regarding this. So I would appreciate any kind of um, communique coming from your, um, from your board back to me regarding what is going on and for additional comments. Yeah, so we'll have the appropriate person reach out. I have your both your email address and your phone number from signing up this morning, um, and we'll have someone reach out to ensure that if there's any further outreach or inreach from you to us, then then all of that happens appropriately. And when when can I expect this person to reach out? And by the way, could I get a, grab a name? I don't know exactly whom would be the right person to make that reach out, um, but uh, I'll make sure that uh, it happens and. I will follow up personally with you to make sure that the reach out has occurred. And your name is Jeff Robbins, correct? Yes, I'm the chair of the commission. Okay, very good. So I will anticipate hearing from someone here shortly and you will provide me with the name of who yes. that is. Okay, yep. very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we thank our public for commenting as always. Uh, we move to the next matter on our agenda, which is consent. Does anyone have questions on consent agenda? Do we have a motion to approve consent? So moved. I'll second. Motion and a second to approve consent. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
consent is approved. Moving further along, <clears throat> we now have a Rule 1203B Comprehensive Wildlife Plan presentation. I believe this comes from Chevron USA. Uh, I have identified on the agenda the following as participants, uh, Patricia Meinrich, John McRoberts, and Josh Millsfall. Looks like folks are getting elevated. Let's give them an opportunity to get signed up. Uh, it looks like some of you are starting to visualize yourselves. Uh, AAG Davenport, if you could visualize uh, when we have folks presenting a comprehensive wildlife plan, is there a need for swearing in, in your opinion? We can certainly go ahead and do it. Um, it wouldn't take very Can't long. Hurt. Why don't sure. we go ahead and do that? We've got four witnesses. Okay. Um, I will ask each of the witnesses to raise their hand, state their name, and say that they swear to tell the truth. We'll do it in turn. I'll go in the order that you're appearing on my screen, and we'll start with Mr. McRoberts, please. My name is John McRoberts, and I swear to tell the truth during this presentation. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> Ms. Minrich? My name is Patricia Minrich, and I also swear to tell the truth during this presentation. Apologize for the mispronunciation. Okay. Mr. Millspaw. I'm Joshua Millspaw, and I will I promise to tell the truth during this presentation. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Anderson. I'm Chuck Anderson. I swear to tell the truth during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Who's going to lead us off here? Thank you, Chair Robbins. I will. So I want to thank the commissioners for your time today and the opportunity to share with you Chevron's comprehensive wildlife plan. Over the last, um, sorry, do we have Ryan McGee? Can we go ahead and start the presentation, please? Thank you. He's driving it for us. Yes, so. it's up and running and we can see it. Great. Thank you. So over the last two years, Chevron has dedicated a team to crafting this comprehensive wildlife plan for the improvement of wildlife and habitat within the Weld County area. We have worked with scientists and conservation experts across the country to inform and implement this plan. This plan is not intended to replace any of the requirements or compensatory fees pursuant to the rules. This plan is intended to be in addition to the rule requirements. As this is not meant to be a compensatory mitigation plan, we are presenting this to the commission for informational purposes and to be transparent with our planning. Ryan, next slide, please. Chevron is dedicated to producing affordable, reliable, ever cleaner energy that enables human progress. Next slide. <laughs> Integral to human progress is bolstering, bolstering the relationship with the natural world. Thus, Chevron is equally focused on leading efforts in wildlife and habitat protection. Chevron has committed to the use of comprehensive planning with the use of comprehensive drilling plans and comprehensive area plans. This landscape level planning contemplates design improvements, potential impacts, and mitigation measures across large scale oil and gas developments. With the establishment of high priority habitats, we saw an opportunity to bring the same innovative large scale planning strategy to the wildlife arena. Through the creation of the comprehensive wildlife plan, we are utilizing science-based data to identify focus areas for mitigations and improvements and to inform enhancement measures that will provide meaningful benefits to wildlife and habitat. Next slide. The Comprehensive Wildlife Plan seeks to go beyond the traditional mitigation hierarchy of avoid, minimize, and mitigate to include improve. When crafting this wildlife plan, nothing was off limits. We imagined what was possible or what we like to call the art of the possible. We want to be proactive in our approach to planning, development, and wildlife protection. That allows us flexibility to operate. This flexibility allows us to continue to innovate, improve, and reduce our impacts while delivering the affordable, reliable, and ever cleaner energy on which we rely. With these goals in mind and with the art of the possible framework, Chevron has created a toolbox of programs to provide meaningful mitigations, improvements, 
and programs that will provide productive habitats and improve habitat functionality. This toolbox of programs is not intended as a pick one and you're done, but we intend to utilize all of these programs. Next slide. So within this toolbox, Chevron is sponsoring a coloring program for pronghorn and mule deer to gain science-based data on migration corridors and wildlife interactions with habitat in the Weld County area. We focused on pronghorn and mule deer as much of our rural development activity overlaps with these species. In February and March of this year, pronghorn and mule deer were successfully outfitted with collars. The Conservation Data Explorer or Codex program is a data collection, mapping and environmental services tool that provides a visualization of migration corridors, gaps in habitat connectivity and habitat stress severity levels. The Codex tool is a public database that is available to all operators and then their industries to aid in the planning of future development. Based on our conversations within the conservation community, an Art of the Possible moment was presented in the form of a native seed nursery, concentrating on the cultivation of seed mixes appropriate for big game and other native species to the front range of Colorado. Habitat restoration enhancement is critical to any wildlife conservation program. Wildlife friendly fencing, pivot corner restorations and habitat management projects are just a few potential components in our efforts to restore and enhance habitat. Habitat defragmentation, or as I like to think of it as filling in the holes of the Swiss cheese, hence my little Swiss cheese diagram, is a program designed to return areas to wildlife uses. Habitat, particularly along the front range of Colorado, is not an uninterrupted green belt, but is dotted with existing oil and gas development, houses and other land developments. Our defragmentation program focuses on plugging and reclaiming legacy oil and gas sites that can be returned to habitat uses. The offset program is in collaboration with Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust, or CALT, to establish conservation easements and enhance existing easements that will improve the quantity and quality of habitat in perpetuity. BMPs such as sand walls during drilling and completion and HPH to reduce noise and light impacts, conducting wildlife ground surveys and mitigations tailored specifically for pronghorn mm -hmm. and mule deer is another one of our programs. Next slide, please. Chevron is collaborating with respected organizations across the US to implement this comprehensive wildlife plan programs. Organizations like the University of Montana Boone and Crockett Wildlife Conservation Program and the State University of New York will conduct the coloring program. The Colorado Parks and Wildlife Support and Cooperation has been instrumental in conducting the coloring program. Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust will enhance and or establish conservation easements. And Colorado State University will maintain the Conservation Data Explorer Codex Mapping and Database Tool. Next slide, please. The FISH diagram represents many of the components, data points, lessons learned, improvements that have influenced our comprehensive wildlife plan. The belly of the FISH depicts the current conditions, baselines, avoidance and habitat fragmentation, while the back of the fish represents the comprehensive wildlife plan approaches for increasing the knowledge base, improving habitat functionality, and increasing productive habitat. Together, all of these components will enable us to protect and bolster wildlife and habitats with responsible energy development. Next slide, please. Comprehensive wildlife plan in sum allows us to design future development, identify potential issues and devise mitigations. Through the comprehensive wildlife plan, we will use a science-based data approach to inform the what, where and when elements for applying mitigations that will beneficially impact wildlife and their habitats. These benefits include advancing the overall understanding of wildlife populations, movements and interactions, informing our responses to wildlife based on new data points, improving and expanding the quality and quantity of wildlife habitat, and leveraging external expertise to achieve our programs. And to speak more about that external expertise, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Joshua Milspa. Thank you, Ryan, you can end this, thanks.
Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, the research uh, that Patricia was um, was discussing um, regarding the collaring project that we pursued um, with mule deer and pronghorn um, in Colorado. So I'm going to give you an overview of the project and our progress to date. So to give you some background about the project, we initiated discussions about this project in the spring of 2023. Uh, we formalized our study objectives in the fall of 2023. Um, this is a three-year collaboration among uh, University of Montana, State University of New York, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and Chevron. And captures for this project will occur in the winters of 2024, 25, and 26. And we anticipate the monitoring that I'm going to discuss through at least uh, 2026. So the goals and objective, the overall goal of this um, research project is to determine how pronghorn and mule deer are using the landscape and their survival in those areas. So that's the broad project goal. More specifically, some objectives we have, we're interested in identifying migration corridors and winter range um, in the area, looking at environmental conditions um, and how they cause mule deer and pronghorn to select and avoid areas and then also mule deer and pronghorn tolerance to landscape features. Um, and the way that we're doing this is through this um, collaborative project with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, and I wanna identify and thank them for their um, involvement and collaboration. Dr. Chuck Anderson is with us today. Also Dr. Matt Aldridge, um, Joe Halseth, and also Lance Carpenter have been instrumental in uh, pursuing this research program. And so what we did is we sought to capture 200 um, pronghorn and mule deer in total and fit them with Iridium satellite GPS radio collars. So we were interested in 140 female pronghorn, 60 female mule deer. And the idea is, is that we're collecting locations every five hours. Um, we are also able to document mortality through mortality sensors in those collars. And the collars also have a drop-off mechanism. Um, so we can remotely drop those collars from those individuals should we be interested in doing that. I do wanna point out, we've got more pronghorn um, given CPW's um, addition and contribution of 80 extra collars for some broader objectives um, that they had. So we used helicopters to capture these pronghorn and mule deer with ground support. Um, all of the institutional animal care and use committee protocols um, were in place with agency universities. And we caught these individuals on private land um, with landowner permission, then also on the Pawnee National Grasslands. So these captures began on February 8th of this year and concluded on March 8th. And in total, we had three capture events and those were spaced out according to weather, helicopter availability and logistics. So we just had to balance when we could do it based on those factors. And what we did was the Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, spotter plane located animals, communicated that with ground uh, personnel to help direct the helicopter to capture sites and locations. We followed those animal care and use protocols uh, to limit mortality. And we were also prepared to stop if mortality exceeded those protocols. The results of this work, uh, we were fortunate in that we were able to deploy all 200 collars during those three capture events. Uh, we did not have any issues with landowners or mortality limits or collars. Um, everything worked uh, very well. We also have been pleased with the spatial coverage that we have of those collars that will allow us to address the study objectives. And so far as of July 15th, we've had eight pronghorn mortalities, three mule deer mortalities, and already we have um, obtained over 140,000 GPS locations of these radio collared individuals. I just wanted to give you a broad perspective and broad view of the data that we have been collecting. Um, this includes uh, what you see here in this image are individual animals with their uh, radio collar location information, both pronghorn and mule deer, 
each color represents a different individual animal. That's why it looks um, as it does. And if we break this down further and look at pronghorn first, you can see the really nice broad spatial coverage that exists um, with those collaring activities, which, is, which was the goal and what we were, were hoping to accomplish there. Mule deer, we do have a few less um, individuals that are radio collared. That's why you don't see quite um, as, as, as broad a pattern as you do with, with pronghorn. Um, and again, this represents just preliminary information since captures just a few months ago. And it is too early to draw any conclusions yet. Uh, but most, most importantly, we simply wanted to provide and show you the distribution of um, data that we've been able to collect uh, so far. Um, we do have um, additional information that provides good spatial resolution um, on movements of these individuals from location to location. This will be the kind of information that we intend to use to meet those study objectives that I mentioned earlier. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and to talk with you about the project today. Thank you. Great, does that con <clears throat> conclude the presentation? Yes, it does. All right, uh, as is our normal case, the panelists, I suppose, open for questions from any of the commissioners. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you. I've got maybe a question and a couple of comments, but I appreciate you being here today and thank you for the presentation and for the uh, significant collaboration uh, of, of this uh, plan. Uh, this question is probably for you, uh, Ms. Minorich. Uh, one slide showed the general wildlife plan programs at a glance, and you don't need to pull that back up, but uh, as Chevron was developing those categories that are guiding this project and this plan, can you, can you talk just very briefly about how those uh, program areas were developed and were they in collaboration or were they developed within Chevron? Yes, thank you. So it was a combination. We started um, when we kicked off this group a couple of years ago, researching everything we could about available programs for restoration and for collaring conservation in general. So we put together a menu of programs from our research and from our discussions with conservation communities. So we've been attending conferences throughout the country meeting with you know groups such as Boone and Crockett and the different universities and so we've been kind of fielding queries of you know hey does this sound like we're on the right track and trying to figure out you know how we should proceed and that's again how the native seed nursery came about we've heard issues that you know supplies for seeds for some of the big game are not always plentiful due to drought conditions and certain things so we thought Let's focus on that and try to figure out how we can establish demonstration areas to grow some of these seeds. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, largely just wanted to say that I, I very much commend this effort. We often hear the term industry leading when we talk about oil and gas technologies. I would call this an industry leading effort with regard to wildlife conservation in energy development. I'm familiar with Dr. Millspaw's work and certainly familiar with Dr. Anderson's work. Nice to see you again, Dr. Anderson. And uh, know that you've brought in significant wildlife experts to, uh, to manage this project, which is part of the Greater Comprehensive Plan. Um, I have made comments before about, in public and private, about uh, oil and gas companies through their conservation efforts becoming part of the conservation community. And would note that I appreciate Chevron's efforts to do just that in attending conferences, as you noted, and in um, this uh, broad collaboration between uh, a number of uh, different uh, uh, different experts in this in this project. So I also wanted to point out that I, I very much appreciate your, you, you highlighted it very briefly, but your efforts to move beyond the traditional hierarchy to improve, that's very much part of the uh, conservation planning that will help ensure long-term conservation of wildlife. So I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this project goes and how this uh, effort and plan are applied to future efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Further questions for the panel? Commissioner uh, Messner? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no questions, but like Commissioner Ackerman, I, I do want to commend um, the effort that was put into this uh, comprehensive wildlife planning um, effort. Uh, I think this shows the, uh, like Commissioner Ackerman indicated, you know, industry leading efforts towards looking at wildlife um, mitigation uh, holistically through the utilization of, in this case, a CDP, uh, but I think also is a great um, lens uh, or, or, or way to approach comprehensive wildlife planning in both comp uh, CDPs and comprehensive area plans. And I think this is a, a great example of what can be accomplished with that um, large landscape level planning that some of these uh, CAPs and CDPs offer. And I think this um, this is just a shining example of what I hoped would happen in the development of the concepts around CDPs and comprehensive area plans. And so I commend you for your efforts in this. And uh, um, uh, and so those are my comments, Mr. Chip. Thank you. Agreed. Anything further? Well, we thank you again for the presentation today, and we look forward to uh, additional great efforts on this part. So with that, uh, we will excuse uh, this group and we will move to our next matter on our agenda. Uh, maybe if the next matter, we need to tee up a bunch of witnesses. So let's go ahead and take five. Let's return at 938 and then we'll take up the variance request for Renegade. All right, we are back. Uh, this is the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission. It is our June, July 17th hearing. We will now take up docket 23050177, a variance request from Renegade Oil and Gas Company. Uh, I see Mr. Campbell is with us as attorney for the applicant. Uh, do you have witnesses? We do, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Ingvi and Mr. Condal are here with us today. All right, let's go ahead and get them sworn in as a procedural detail before we get going. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Condal, Mr. Ingvi, I think you've been this, through this before. If you just raise your hand, state your name, and that you swear to tell the truth, we'll move ahead. Mr. Condal? My name's J.B. Condal. I swear to tell the truth. Thank you, Mr. Ingvi. This is uh, Ed Ingvi. I swear to tell the truth for the purpose of this hearing. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, if you'd like to proceed, go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, commissioners and staff. Thank you for hearing this matter today. Um, as, as we've already gone through introductions, um, I do have a procedural issue I'd like to take up with the commission here as a preliminary matter. Um, we were originally told we would have 20 minutes uh, for our presentation here this morning, but the agenda only reflects 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we've labored to make our presentation more concise, uh, but then yesterday at 3.30 p.m., the Adams County LGD filed a 29-page document purporting to be public comment, uh, but in point of fact, it is not public comment. And we really think we're going to need that additional five minutes in order to lodge our objection and make our record uh, on that particular submission. Now, our, our legal arguments are already part of the record, uh, so I can forego summarizing those arguments and, and buy some time from us. Uh, and I can also forego the conventional summary outline of our presentation today. Uh, Mr. Campbell, uh, let me just yes, let me interrupt. Take 20 minutes. Thank you. Is that fair? It is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's okay. A, that's, that's our ask. All right. Go for it. Um, well, as I've noted yesterday, the uh, Adams County LGD filed a 29 page document at 3 30 p.m. purporting to be public comment. Uh, we submit that filing uh, does not meet the criteria for consideration by the commission during its deliberations today. So accordingly, Renegade objects to that filing being considered in this hearing. Uh, first, the county, uh, as an interested party under the rules, could have filed a petition in response to Renegade's applications at any time in the past, and it's never done so. 
Now, the commission's rule 512 on public comment is not intended to be weaponized as a stealth petitioner motion, permitting an entity to effectively make arguments and move for relief without appearing before this commission. The LGD is not submitted to the jurisdiction of this commission, and he would otherwise be required to be represented by counsel per commission rule 515A. And in fact, 515E specifically states that legal arguments must be made through counsel. The LGD is not an attorney or counsel for Adams County. Second, if we take a deeper dive into rule 512, we can clearly determine that the LGD's filing should be uh, sidelined in this proceeding. Uh, rule 512 was amended in 2020, I believe, uh, and the underlying rationale for that amendment is stated in the statement of basis and purpose. Uh, the SBP states, quote, some stakeholders suggested that the commission require public commenters to make statements under oath and subject to cross-examination. The commission did not adopt this suggestion because the law does not require comments at administrative hearings to be made under oath and subject to cross-examination in order to be included in an administrative record. The SPP cites Colorado Department Revenue versus Kirk, 743 P. 2nd 16 at pages 20 to 21, Colorado 1987. The SBP goes on. Indeed, Rule 517B2 incorporates the exact standard set by the Colorado Supreme Court in Kirk, that the commission may consider evidence that would not be admissible under the Colorado Rules of Evidence if the evidence, quote, possesses probative value commonly accepted by reasonable and prudent persons in the conduct of their affairs, close quote. But that's not all Kirk says. Uh, the Kirk case on that same page goes on to say that this standard is not without limits, and that the rules of evidence cannot be so relaxed as to disregard due process of law and fundamental rights. That's at page 21 of the Kirk decision. I think it's important to recognize that the court in Kirk, uh, in evaluating whether the agency could rely on hearsay statements of an out-of-court witness identified by name, um, that court then determined that the opportunity to cross-examine the out-of-court witness was important to its decision in approving the agency, agency reliance on that statement. So the court specifically held that another significant factor, which is important for due process analysis, was that the licensee had the right pursuant to the Colorado Administrative Procedures Act to request that the hearing officer subpoena the witness to attend the hearing. This statutory right provided Kirk with the opportunity to confront and cross-examine any of the officers involved. Specifically, Kirk had the right to subpoena the initial officer and cross-examine him, but failed to do so. That's at pages 21 through 22 of Kirk. Rule 512 instead now completely removes that opportunity by permitting public comment on the eve of hearings and simultaneously denying the parties any opportunity before the hearing or at the hearing to subpoena that, that uh, witness for cross-examination. Moreover, we believe and submit that the LGD's filing does not possess the probative value commonly accepted by reasonable and prudent persons in the conduct of his affairs. So let's look, if we look at the LGD's assertions and requests in, in their filing, uh, first, uh, they attach the administrative order on consent with CDPHE. Well, CDPHE is an interested party. It was served with that application, and it hasn't taken an adverse position in this proceeding, formally or informally. Second, that AOC specifically states at paragraph 23, quote, entering into this settlement shall not constitute an admission of violation of the air quality laws by Renegade. And more importantly, it goes on to say, quote, nor shall the division or any third party infer it to be such an admission by renegade in any administrative or judicial proceeding. So the LGD nonetheless submitted this AOC as ostensibly relevant to this particular proceeding, even though the terms of the AOC expressly preclude him from doing so. Finally, on, on the CDPHE AOC, uh, the L LGD demands that the commission elicit proof that Renegade is in compliance with the AOC. Well, but again, paragraph 13 on page 12 of the AOC states that compliance under the AOC is triggered when the combustors are placed back in service by Renegade. Well, that's why we're here today. So there is no testimony to, to provide on that particular issue. Uh, 
Um, we think the LGD has effectively filed a, a, a motion without appearing before this commission and without giving us an opportunity to adequately respond. The LGD next points to uh, cryptocurrency mining in Arapahoe County and asserts that uh, uh, Arapahoe County doesn't permit data centers uh, under its regulations. But again, Arapahoe County received this application. It was an interested per party and it didn't file for party status and it didn't file public comment. And I'm not sure what standing uh, Adams County would have on that issue in any event, formally or informally. Moreover, the LGD doesn't cite any of the governing regulations for us or the commission to review and evaluate. And you're gonna hear from Mr. Condal that the Arapahoe County LGD at the time Renegade was conducting these operations had a different interpretation of how the, how the Arapahoe co uh, County regulations work. The LGD next asserts that Renegade needs to comply with Adams County crypto regulations. Renegade intends to do so. Its slides reflect that. Um, and then finally, the LGD argues that unpaid oil and gas inspection invoices are somehow relevant here. Well, that's not a public health, safety, welfare, environmental, wildlife, or waste issue over which this commission has jurisdiction. Renegade has principled and legal reasons for not paying those fees, which will be resolved in another venue. The commission has no more jurisdiction to pass on the legitimacy of those positions than it does to file enforcement actions under county regulations for alleged violations of county regulations where the counties declined to take any action. So uh, commissioner, uh, commissioners, uh, we have a number of other objections, but in, in the interest of time, um, and for all those reasons, we don't believe there's any legitimate basis for the commission to give any credence to the LGD's filing, and we therefore object to the LGD's filing as submitted to you yesterday. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, let me see if I can summarize your position. The Adams County LGD made a filing yesterday um, and you're objecting to it for various on the various grounds as you've just indicated. Is that correct? Yes. And would like it. Okay. All right. All right. I, as one commissioner, uh, may was made aware of this by your statement. I had not. I had not seen the filing. Um, I have gone online during your oral argument, and I see the filing is there. Um. Normally, these sorts of matters would be taken up outside of a public hearing before the commissioners with the hearing officer. I do not see that the hearing officer has made any indication with regard to the filing pro con or otherwise. Uh, I do not know if my other commissioners are aware of the filing. I would hesitate that perhaps they're not aware either because we generally look at the stuff that's in our portfolio and this was not in the portfolio. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps the best uh, outcome, and we don't have a great outcome because we weren't aware of this, is to continue this matter for a bit to allow these procedural processes to be weighed in by the hearing officer. Uh, I'm not in a position to be able to make a determination as to whether the filing is appropriate or inappropriate because I've not read the filing. Uh, so I would move to continue this matter for say two weeks allow the hearing officer mr campbell allow you to make your arguments to the hearing officer tee this up as we normally would so that uh we're not caught off guard as we are this morning with regard to the filing mr campbell do you have uh, well first off let me see if i've got a second and other commissioners if you have any thoughts about this weigh in mr chair i'll second i'm in the same uh same boat as you all right, you have a motion and a second. Uh, before we deliberate on the motion, Mr. Campbell, uh, realizing you probably would like to move on with the matter on the substance, do you understand how I'm trying to uh, take care of due process rights on all parts? And are you, is you and you are you and your client comfortable with a slight continuance to allow due process to take place here? It, might we go offline just for two or three minutes, Mr. Commit, uh, Mr. Chair, and so I can discuss that with my client. Yeah, that's fine. Let's return at 956. Uh, Mr. Campbell, did you have a chance to consult with your client? Uh, I did, Mr. Chair, and 
the renegade is here it would like to proceed with its application and um, have you deliberate on it but uh, if the commission believes that it needs to defer this uh, to take up this uh, issue with the Adams County LGD submission, um, my client will de defer to your judgment on that issue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think it is most appropriate to continue it. Uh, I would suggest the continuance is to August 31st, which is two weeks out. Um, not only do we have the issue in this docket, but we've got an issue that I want to make sure that we deal with appropriately. This is kind of an issue of first impression where a local government has made a filing the day before a hearing on a variance request. And I just want to make sure that we appropriately address all matters. So, um, commissioners, does anybody else desire? That's kind of my deliberative thoughts on that. Uh, any other thoughts? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm fine with proceeding in that manner. I just want to make sure that you mean July 31st, not August 31st. Yeah, I'm sorry, July 31st. 31st. Commissioner Messner. You're back. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm 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 good with that. Uh continuing until July 31st. Um, I did actually have an opportunity to read that this morning when I looked at the docket. I would note that it's a three-page submittal, 29 pages total, but the rest have been previously submitted. And so really the new items in there are about three pages. But uh, I think continuance makes sense on this particular matter. Um, so I appreciate your consideration for that. All right. Uh, thank you for the deliberative thoughts. Kind of a little bit of a curveball here. We look forward to... Voting on the motion, all those in favor of the continuance indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Campbell, uh, again, appreciate your client's perspective. Uh, we do want to take up the substance of this matter at the appropriate time. Uh, I would suggest to hearings officer Ber Berman that he take this matter up expeditiously and um, bring it back to us with appropriate due process for all involved. All right, the docket is closed on today's agenda. Uh, we will now move to our last docket, which is 22120369, a financial assurance variance request from Platinum Gas Properties. So we probably need to get folks elevated on that. Mr. Chair, we cannot find Mr. Robert Simmons, who was indicated to be a panelist. Okay. Uh, Mr. Willis, as attorney for the applicant, could you visualize yourself? Yes. Good morning. I'm Good sorry, morning. I had to do a shuffle from one conference room to the other. Uh, here at the law office. Uh, Mr. Simmons is with me here today. Uh, so if uh, uh, I, I'll just pass the screen to him when he comes to presentation. Why don't we go ahead and get him sworn in to begin with? Mr. Simmons, hello. Uh, I'm going to swear you in now. If you just raise your hand, state your name and say that you swear to tell the truth, please go ahead. I'm Robert Simmons, and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Willis, I believe we've got uh, an opportunity to hear from you and your client with regard to the variance request. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners and staff. On behalf of my client, Platinum Gas Properties, LLC, I'd like to thank you for considering this variance request. When the original application in this matter was filed by Platinum Gas, it, uh, it consisted of two aspects. One, a Rule 702 Option 5 financial assurance plan with demonstrated costs, and two, a variance request from Rule 705B 
minimum, minimal amount of general liability insurance required to cover sudden and accidental pollution uh, and remediation from oil and gas related uh, operations. This past April, Platinum Gas filed its amended application, which struck the, the Rule 702 Option 5 financial assurance plan from the application. Platinum Gas has successfully submitted a new Form 3 financial assurance plan with Option 3 selected for demonstrated costs via e-form and looks forward to working with ECMC staff as it considers its bona fide estimated costs for reclamation, hopefully yielding an, access, uh, an acceptable single well financial assurance obligation under option three with demonstrated costs. That said, the variance request from rule 705B, general liability insurance remains. Platinum Gas has one witness to call today to provide testimony supporting its variance request, and that is Bob Simmons. Mr. Simmons is the managing member of Platinum Gas Properties LLC has in, and has been involved with Platinum Gas since its inception. Now a, qu a quick background as to Platinum Gas's operations and how its unique operating circumstances give rise to this variance request. Platinum Gas operates three shallow Niobrara formation gas wells in the Beecher Island field of Yuma County. To orient you to the location of the wells, they are found in easternmost Colorado, just six miles from the Kansas border and some 13 miles south of Ray, Colorado. The wells are all located on fee surface and the surface belongs to two members of, I'm sorry, to a member of the platinum gas and one member who is a putative member of, of the company. The wells are situated entirely on the, the Simmons Ranch, a ranch fully owned by Bob and his wife, Luann Simmons, Mary Lou, I'm sorry, Mary Lou Simmons and Quentin and his wife, Tanya Simmons. The, the ranch is operated by Bob and Quentin Simmons, father and son. It consists of a, contigu a contiguous 3,320 acres of agricultural lands. These wells produce minerals belonging to the Simmons family. The three wells were brought into production in early 2009. The wells produced dry gas from the Niobrara formation. The location for each well consists of only the wellhead and gathering system riser tied to the wellhead. Each location is protected by livestock fencing. There are no gas separators and no production tank tanks to handle either uh, condensate or produced water. Gathered gas is then transported to an own resources metering shed also situated on Simmons Ranch lands, where the gas is transferred downstream. The wells have generally been placed on continual production without incident. Simmons Ranch LLC maintains a $1 million liability insurance on its agricultural operations. At the conclusion of the testimony, Simmons Gas will assert that it has provided evidence satisfying rule 502C variance requirements in that one, Platinum Gas has obtained bona fide quotes from an insurance company for general liability insurance in the amounts of both $5 million and $1 million per occurrence. Paying the premium, the insurance premium on the $5 million policy will likely result in the wells being uneconomic as operating costs will outweigh revenue. The significant reduction in premium costs to $1 million should, should provide positive economics for the three dry, dry gas wells. Platinum gas cannot foresee an incident or event which may give rise to a claim against the liability coverage giving its operations in a remote location on lands owned by its members. Rule 705B should not be a one size fits all. Platinum gas asserts that the higher insurance premium Maintaining the $5 million policy is not reasonable and is not necessary and will result in economic waste. Two, the requested variance aligns with the basic intent of the act. The commission recognizes in critical part of Senate Bill 19-181's mandate, and uh, open quote, requires every operator to provide assurance that is financially capable of fulfilling every obligation imposed by the act and the commission rules, close quote. The commission, by approving premium platinum gases variance request, 
reducing liability to $1 million requirement per $1 million per occurrence will provide adequate insurance that platinum gas is capable of fulfilling its obligations imposed as it conducts operations in the state solely on the Simmons Ranch. Three, the requested variance is necessary to avoid undue hardship because production from platinum gas as wells provides direct benefits to various parties, including royalty owners and domestic gas users, and indirectly to consumers by providing gas to the local supply chain. Four, the requested variance will not result in a net adverse impact to public health, safety, and welfare, the environment, or wildlife resources. Five, the requested variance can be temporary. It can be subject to review uh, by, by the commission and subject to reasonable and necessary conditions of approval to protect and minimize impacts to public public self I'm sorry, public health, safety, welfare, and the environment, including wildlife resources. The ask of platinum gas today is that the commission approve the variance to rule 705B by reducing its minimum coverage obligations from $5 million to $1 million per occurrence on five Ending the reduced minimum will of fulfilling operations imposed by the act as it conducts operations in the state. That concludes my opening statement. Mr. Willis, just be aware your internet is cutting in and out and we got most of that, but like toward the end when you switched it over to the witness, we weren't able to hear you. All right. Thank Good. You. Okay. Good morning, Chairman Robbins and Commissioners. My name is Robert Simmons. I'm managing a member of Platinum Gas Properties, LLC. And since I'm under oath, a retired rancher. We are owner of the Simmons Ranch along with my son, Quentin Simmons. I'd like to thank my attorney, Rob Willis, for his opening statements and putting this matter before you today. Platinum gas is before you seeking a variance from rule 705B as it imposes a minimum amount of $5 million of general liability insurance for an operator to conduct oil and gas operations in the state. This requirement doesn't appear to distinguish between the complexity of production or the amount of operations. I believe that reduction of the minimal amount of coverage to a million dollars general liability is reasonable and will provide assurance that platinum gas is financially as capable of fulfilling every obligation imposed on it by the act and the ECMC rules. I'd like to start my testimony by describing platinum gas's operation. As Mr. Willis said, I've been involved with platinum gas since its inception. In 2009, Platinum Gas obtained funding to drill three shallow gas wells, making dry gas production from Niobrara formation underlying what is Simmons Ranch lands. I, along with my son, Quentin Simmons, own and operate the Simmons Ranch and the minerals produced from the wells. The ranch comprises about 3,320 acres of primarily agricultural lands is found in easternmost Colorado, less than six miles from Kansas and about 13 miles to the south of the town of Ray, Colorado. The Simmons Ranch is a working ranch where livestock feed is grown and livestock are raised. The Simmons Ranch also hosts the three gas wells owned and operated by Platinum Gas. Simmons Ranch maintains a million dollars worth of liability insurance for its operation agricultural operations. Uh, Platinum Gas consists of four members, which would be me and my wife, Mary Lou, and Norman and Gloria Lansphere from Belfouche, South Dakota. My son, Quentin, gets, uses gas from a gas well on his land and his royalties to heat his dwelling. Each location is protected by livestock fencing. Uh, there are no gas separators and no production tanks to handle either the condensate or the produced water. 
Each gas well location consists of only the wellhead and the gathering system risers tied to the wellhead. Gathered gas is then transported to a known resources metering shed located on land ranch lands where the gas is transferred downstream. The wells have generally been placed on continual production since they were drilled without incident. There are a couple of ranch houses which would belong to myself and also to my son, uh, Quentin and his wife, and then all the other unoccupied structures located on the ranch. The nearest residents outside the boundaries of the ranch are approximately 600, 6,600 feet to the west of the nearest platinum gas operated well, and about 4,300 feet to the east of the nearest platinum gas operated well. I have brainstormed possible, possible events where an adversely affected party may suffer damage or injury from platinum gas operated wells and cannot think of any sudden or accidental event where the insurance coverage would be needed. The suggestion that I cannot identify such an event does not rule out the need for general liability insurance. Hence, the request for reduced $1 million liability insurance. Platinum gas has obtained quotes from an insurance company for a minimal, minimum coverage of both $5 million and $1 million at general liability insurance, including sudden and accidental pollution. What I can tell you is operating at three wells is uneconomic given the premiums for the $5 million policy at the depressed commodity prices. Premiums for the $1 million policy greatly reduce our profits from its operations. However, operating the wells should be economic. That is the extent of my testimony, and I want to thank you for your consideration. I will gladly answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Mr. Willis, does this conclude your presentation? Thank you, Chair. It does. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, commissioners, the witness is available for questions at this point in time. I, I have to be honest with you. I'm a, a little hesitant to grant this variance request for a number of reasons. I'll go ahead and just sort of talk about that. And I'm, I'm not, I've not made a decision yet, but, uh, you know, the uh, minimum of 5 million was something that the commission came to uh, as a policy call for liability insurance for all of Colorado, whether it's one well or a hundred wells. Um, and uh, it's not just to protect the surface owners, it's to protect, you know, contractors that may be out there or, or others, that, et cetera. And uh, I'm not sure that we've we've satisfied that this does not go against the basic intent of the act. But I'm not sure that we have satisfied that there's no net adverse impacts because it's speculative as to whether 1 million is going to be enough versus 5 million. Um, and we do not take into account the economics of matters when we're dealing with the five ob objective criteria for a variance request in 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 my mind. Um, so you didn't testify as to how much the five million dollar premium is versus the one million, but I don't think that's relevant at this point in time. I don't know that I've got any further questions. Um, does other commissioners have questions of the applicant or the attorney? Seeing no questions, does anybody want to further deliberate? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I generally concur with uh, your perspective on this, and I think that you um, clearly lined out some of the deficiencies in the application. Um, I will just note that this 
scenario and the reasons for requiring this general liability insurance are clearly lined out both in the rules and through page 73 to um, 76 of the statement and basis and purpose, which, you know, talks about the necessity for the general liability insurance, the, um, the, the, the actual contemplation that we had during the rulemaking about whether this was enough or not, understanding that um, there's great variance and potential remediation costs associated with you know, any oil and gas activity in the state. And I don't think that the applicant has met its burden of proof for a variance, um, both because of the items that you stated. And I would highlight that uh, um, as you review the rules and the act, uh, that the requested variance will not violate the basic intent of the act. Uh, and so for those reasons, I would uh, agree with your interpretation and I, I, I'm not gonna be in support of this application. Further deliberation from commissioners? Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just say I agree. I think to me, the biggest thing is that while recognizing the issues unique to the situation, I, I don't think that we take into account economic conditions. We're not here to try and make things easier for the operators. We're here to make sure that things are done in a safe, responsible manner. That's all. Seeing no further deliberation, uh, I would move denial of the variance request based upon the commission comments and deliberations. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Is there further deliberation? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Willis, for the presentation. Uh, the commission's decision is noted for the record. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. Uh, that concludes the items on our agenda for today. Uh, we would then move have a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. We'll see you next week, folks. Thanks.